Brian Hare. I'm a professor uh, at a university called Duke University in the state of North Carolina. I am really interested in humans and our origin and where our intelligence and our psychology uh, comes from, from an evolutionary perspective. This book, uh, The Survival of the Friendliest, is uh, somewhat provocative. Yeah, I am aware of survival of the fittest being of uh, the way that most people think about and understand evolution, that uh, the big, strong, alpha um, person or animal or group is the one that is dominant and wins and leaves their offspring. And what how that gets construed in people's mind, though, is not only are they alpha, bigger and stronger, but somehow that means they have more moral value, that somehow they're better that they're superior. Um, and so that's a total misconstrual of Darwin's ideas. Um, and so survival of the friendliest is a, a playful, um, I hope helpful way to push back and remind everyone or introduce everyone to the real fact of evolution, which is species, organisms, individuals, whole classes of organisms that uh, perform the best in life, that actually are the most successful, almost without exception, their success depends on a type of friendliness that evolves, a new type of friendliness that evolves, that allows for a new type of cooperation. And then those species go off to flourish and, um, you know, do very, very well. It is survival of the friendliest uh, that wins in the game of life and survival of the fittest as people in popular and people's popular understanding. It's a misconstrual, a misunderstanding of the science. Uh, when you say new, new type of friendliest, well, what does that mean? I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, so there, there is one species uh, that lives on Antarctica on land and is a vertebrate, so an animal with a backbone. Um, and that is the emperor penguin. So the emperor penguin is the only species on the planet uh, without the help of fossil fuels uh, that can survive the Antarctic winter uh, mm -hmm. on land. And how do they do it? They evolved a new type of friendliness. They cuddle all winter. Mm -hmm. So they are attracted to strangers. They're attracted to other penguins. They smoosh up against each other and hundreds, thousands will keep each other warm for the entire winter. Mm -hmm. So they could not survive in that location without that type of friendliness. Another fun example is uh, there's a species of fish a type of fish um, and people, anybody who's watched an animal documentary has been fascinated often by this type of fish that cleans the mouths of other fish. So they're called cleaner wrasse or cleaner fish. They swim towards the predator and not only do they swim towards the predator, they swim in their mouth. It's amazing. So this new type of friendliness I'm going to swim into your mouth, the fish that eats all the other fish. I'm going to swim in your mouth and I'm going to clean your mouth. And guess what? Predatory fish don't eat them. The predatory fish bring a meal to them. It relaxes the fit, the predatory fish. Uh, and this new type of friendliness has led to a huge, hugely successful uh, species. In your book, you mentioned that the friendliest evolves from the self uh, domestication. Can you tell us a little bit about what self-domestication is? Yeah, so the idea of self-domestication is that um, friendliness, or like in the case of the cleaner wrasse, where they lose their fear of a predatory fish and they actually become attracted and friendly towards a predator, that that type of friendliness is a type of domestication, but it happens naturally. It happens due to natural selection that being friendly is advantageous. So when you see a type of friendliness that is advantageous in nature, and natural selection is favoring that type of friendliness, 
Um, we call that self-domestication. And the reason we call it self-domestication is because it's often paired with some other strange, surprising changes. When you, when you select uh, an organism for a new type of friendliness, often it changes their genetics in a way that there's some other changes that happen in their appearance or in how quickly they grow up and they develop and turn into a mature animal um, or uh, how their body, how their physiology operates. Dogs are the perfect example of this. Wolves were attracted to people. The w only wolves that could be fearless and friendly towards people would have been able to take advantage of the new opportunity of being near people. Um, and they were at an advantage and friendliness paid off. So that's what we think the beginning of our best friends, uh, what their, the beginning of their story was. It was wolves choosing us. In your book, you mentioned about the Bonobo experiment. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how different it might be with different uh, species? The Bonobo evidence is we have two closest relatives uh, that are alive, uh, chimpanzees and bonobos. Uh, they are sister species. So what we've discovered is that these two sister species, they evolved to be very different from each other when it comes to their social life. And we think it's because bonobos evolve to be friendlier because females, female bonobos, were in a, a situation in nature where they could form really strong friendships in a way that chimpanzee females can't. And because female bonobos could become good friends, when male bonobos tried to be all big and alpha and try to coerce females or um, you know, be aggressive or hurt individuals in the group, the females would just say, um, that's my friend and you can't do that. And so we're gonna form a coalition and together, even though we're physically smaller than any of the males, we have enough power together where we can stop them from being aggressive. And that changed the whole cost benefit payoff of male behavior. And now females were able to express a preference for friendliness. And now male friendliness became much more advantageous. And what we've seen is that bonobos are the only member of the great ape family that we belong to, where they are the only member of the great ape family who has never been observed to murder another member of their species. No bonobo has ever killed another bonobo. Chimpanzees kill each other um, at an alarming frequency. Uh, gorillas will kill each other. Orangutans occasionally will kill each other. And of course, we know about our own species. Bonobos, again, have never been observed to murder. Wow. Bonobos aren't afraid of strangers. They're attracted to strangers. And what we found in our experiments is when you give bonobos a chance to share either with someone they've never met or another bonobo they know very well, they actually prefer to help and share with a stranger because it's a new potential friend and there's no threat and a chimpanzee would be terrified to do that. So uh, the, the point of all this work is to say evolution has shaped our two closest relatives based on their biology to either be attracted to strangers or afraid of strangers. And there's a real biological basis to how we interact with different groups. And I do think given that bonobos have been selected to be so friendly and they have new forms of cooperation, that maybe we could think about that happening in the history, the evolutionary history of our own species. So uh, if we are the ones uh, who survived because we were friendly and we are a little bit more cooperative and, and one not, what happened now? <laughs> why are we so <laughs> divided and why are we uh, hating each other? <laughs> How do you yeah. see that? So we are a friendlier species than the other extinct humans. What I'm suggesting is we're friendlier. They were not very friendly. Um, and so we became friendlier and the new type of friendliness is that if we see other individuals of our species that we don't know and we've never met, but they share our identity, then we can very quickly form bonds with them. We can care about somebody we've never met as if they were family within minutes or hours or days of interaction. 
No other species in the history of the, of the planet has that ability to form that quickly, that deep of a bond with a complete stranger. Only humans have all these arbitrary ways to recognize who's in our group or not in our group. And that's what allows us to then meet strangers and increase the size of our groups and supercharge our culture. So, well, wait a second. So where's the, where's the problem with that? Where does it come? And so, uh, sadly, or, or maybe in an exciting way, scientifically, uh, our friendliness actually solves the paradox of our cruelty as well. Because not only are we the kindest or the friendliest species of human that evolved, but we're also the cruelest. And it's, I think, the exact same mechanism that allows us to be friendly that also leads us to be so cool. Because I just told you when we meet individuals that share a identity with us, a stranger that shares identity, we can bond with them and they become like family. Well, that means we care about them and we care about our identity as if it's family. But if they're threatened, then we become incredibly violent and can be very cruel to anyone who threatens those who we feel um, threaten our identity. Um, and so that is the paradox of human nature, where we are the kindest and the cruelest human species that evolved. And of course, um, it is the big challenge that we now all face to deal with our nature and design our societies to not only acknowledge that, but to then thrive and have strategies, social strategies, uh, so that we can have a friendlier future. Our team organizes a forum called SBSD Forum. And this year our theme is rewriting democracy. And, and right now, I think all over the world, democracy is kind of fading, is not doing as it, it well as it should. Uh, when we put this theory of friendliness together, and, and how can we uh, think this with democracy, do you think? Yeah, so I think the most important thing to understand is that we did not evolve to be despots. We did not evolve to live under authoritarian rule. Uh, our nature is actually one that is much more democratic. Uh, when you look at how humans lived uh, before agriculture, generally it would be something we would recognize as a very democratic social system uh, mm -hmm. where individuals were recognized as relatively equal. There, it was, there was no chief, there was no boss. And actually um, what it, one of the main theories is that um, weaker individuals or smaller individuals um, often would form coalitions against any individual who tried to be despotic or tried to be authoritarian, even in a group of 100 people. Um, and really it's when you have agriculture uh, in the last three to five to 7,000 years where you have large groups of people and you have uh, the necessity for both specialization and hierarchy. So specialization in jobs and then hierarchy in terms of there are different groups of people within your society that um, you know, have different roles and have different levels of power. Um, that's the origin of authoritarianism uh, in terms of a social structure in our species. So what you have with today's world order and constitutional uh, or liberal democracies is large scale societies that have the rule of law, a constitutional government where all members of society are recognized as being equal. That's much more like what our societies would have been like before agriculture. Uh, but then there are mechanisms to deal with the fact that there has to be some kind of um, uh, exchange of power and hierarchy and decision making when you have groups that are that large. And so uh, democracies are, when they're well designed, uh, they're designed so that even when you're not in power, you're not out of power. Um, and so, um, you know, most authoritarian governments, when you are out of power, you're out of luck. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think that those basic facts, I think, help 
if people understand that foundation that that um, uh, human nature is not one of despotism uh, and that we have a long both history and prehistory of uh, preference for democratic uh, society and and norms and so what we can do is to try to um, uh, you know talk about how we can solidify our institutions and remember uh, how powerful uh, democracies can be even though it's hard to have them uh, you know flawless the you know everybody knows the famous Winston Churchill quote you know democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms um, and so you know democracy and all her flaws is really uh, probably our best way forward if we want to have a friendlier future. At this time and uh, day and age, what do you think we should be thinking the most? Well, I would say anything we can do to humanize each other and especially our rivals, um, it will immunize us from the worst of human nature. So anything we can do to humanize and form friendships with groups that we feel uncomfortable about or that we feel distrust of. Um, and of course, you know, uh, it's trust and verify. Um, you know, this isn't, you know, saying, oh, let's all go lay in a field of flowers together and hold hands. Um, what this is saying is, uh, the idea is saying, if you want to prevent the worst of human nature and give the best of human nature a chance, then we must uh, humanize each other and we must form cross-group friendships. Otherwise, you can expect cruelty. Yeah.